Hello and welcome to Railway Engineering. My name is Dr. Mark Taylor. This lecture is part two of Unit 1 Railway Systems and Transport. So let's recap on some of what we looked at in part one of this unit. Uh, the opening of the Stockton and Darlington Railway on the 27th of September 1825 was a great occasion. Not only was it the first public passenger railway in the world, but it was pulled by one of the first steam locomotives. And most people had never seen anything like this before, and hence 40,000 people turned, up, turned out to witness it. Then the Liverpool and Manchester Railway was primarily built to provide fast and cheap transportation of raw materials and finished goods between the port of Liverpool and the mills in Manchester and the surrounding towns. We looked at the work of George Stevenson, Robert Stevenson, Charles Vignol and Joseph Locke. In the second half of part one, we looked at the redesign of stations to accommodate more passengers and larger trains. We looked at electrification and the subsequent infrastructure requirements. We also looked at high speed rail vehicles and associated infrastructure. So just to recap on the uh, structure of the module, uh, Unit 1 is looking at railway systems and transport, and this is part two of Unit 1. So during this session, I aim to illustrate uh, the differences in track gauge and how they're addressed using some case studies. I'm going to introduce the concepts of loading and structure gauge. And I'm going to demonstrate the key principles of rail vehicle stability and track loading. So at the end of this lesson, you should be able to differentiate between static and dynamic loading gauges, analyze the stability of a rail vehicle on a track due to the wheel rail interface, and also deconstruct the track loading system on a typical railway. So let's start by looking at the track system. So the problem with technology is that uh, we often see uh, innovation uh, coinciding with uh, lots of alternatives to the same problem. Uh, for example, if you look across the world, just look at the differences in uh, socket plugs uh, for domestic electrical use. Uh, we have to go take uh, adapters when we go on holiday because of the variation. Uh, the VHS versus the Betamax videotape. The Betamax tapes were actually uh, smaller, more compact, greater quality, but VHS too cold. The computer you're using, some of you are probably using Windows machines, some of you are probably on an Android tablet, some of you have probably got an Apple machine. So there are various solutions to the, the concept of an operating system. And most recently, when we consider the ways we communicate online, uh, there are a whole range of different social media applications and platforms that we can use. Uh, some of us will choose to use Facebook, Viber, WhatsApp, Snapchat, Instagram. And then when we touch on the subject of uh, conference calls and communication for work purposes, uh, we've got WebEx, we've got Zoom, we've got Google Hangouts. Uh, we've got a whole range of solutions to the same problem. The development of railway technology was no different. The pioneers of railway engineering did what they thought was best. They developed innovative solutions to the same problem, but those different solutions led to some of the problems that we still face today. So do you remember this image? Well, remember that the four foot eight and a half inch gauge, which has been adopted by 60% of the railways internationally, was based around the width of a horse. Because remember, in the early days of the wagonways, the horses pulled the timber carts. So what does this actually mean? So let's now have a look at some of the differences in track gauge. So the story of track gauge starts off with Isambard Kingdom Brunel. He was born on the 9th of April, 1806 and died on the 15th of September 1859. He was an English civil engineer who is considered to be one of the most ingenious and prolific figures of the Industrial Revolution. He changed the face of the English landscape with his groundbreaking designs and ingenious constructions. Brunel built dockyards, the Great Western Railway, 
and a series of steamships, including the first propeller-driven transatlantic steamship, and numerous important bridges and tunnels. His designs revolutionised public transport and modern engineering. The Royal Albert Bridge is a railway bridge which spans the River Tamar in England between Plymouth and Devon and Saltash in Cornwall. Its unique design consists of two 138.7 metre lenticular iron trusses, 30.5 metres above the water, with conventional plate girder approach spans. This gives it a total length of 666.8 metres. It was opened by Prince Albert in 1859. Brunel actually died later that year and his name was placed above the portals at either end of the bridge as a memorial. Box Tunnel passes through Box Hill on the Great Western Main Line between Bath and Chippenham. The railway tunnel is 1.83 miles or 2.95 kilometres in length. It's straight and it descends on a 1 in 100 gradient from its eastern end. The portals are actually listed Box Tunnel was constructed between December 1838 and June 1841 for the Great Western Railway, under the direction of Isambard Brunel. Building such a tunnel was considered dangerous at the time because of its length and the composition of the underlying strata. The main contractor was George Burge from Hern Bay. When completed, it was the world's longest railway tunnel. So in the 1830s, Burnell did not choose the four foot eight and a half inch gauge used on the other railways. He decided upon a seven foot and a quarter inch gauge as he thought it would give him a better railway. Burnell's gauge had advantages and disadvantages. It provided an excellent ride quality. It also needed straighter alignment, which has actually helped trains uh, travel faster today. But trains could not be used with the wider network and vice versa which led to some serious problems. So in 1845, the Gauge Commission declared that the four foot eight and a half inch gauge, or 1,435 millimetres, would become the standard, mainly because 87% of the railways had already been built to that gauge. The standard gauge was also cheaper to construct and conversion from broad to narrow easier to carry out as no additional track bed widening would be required. This image shows the joint running of gauges on Brunel's railway for a time. A complex track system, which clearly requires more extensive maintenance. So let's now have a look at gauges throughout the world. Most of mainland Europe, the US and Canada, China, the Middle East and Australia use standard gauge. In Europe, Ireland, Spain, Portugal and the Baltic states operate on a different gauge. This is not so much of an issue for Ireland as it's not physically connected to anywhere else. The European Union is keen to promote interoperability across member states. Spain is building a new high speed line to standard gauge, but Spain actually has four different gauges within the country. The Baltic states have been given assistance to convert and transcontinental freight from China to Europe is being trialled. India has two prominent gauges, the first being metre gauge. They use this in some of the mountainous regions in India to help deal with the topography and allow for very tight radius curves. For mainline running, they use broad gauge, which is 1,676 millimetres. So in Ireland, they started off with a number of different gauges, 1,435, 1,880, 1,575 millimetres. In 1843, the Board of Trade decreed that 1,600 millimetres was the standard. And this can also be found in Victoria, parts of South Australia, as introduced by the Irish engineer F.W. Shields. And the 1,600 millimetre gauge is also used in Brazil. So there are still some modern day mixed gauge tracks in use. If you go to Spain, you'll find the 1668 millimeter Iberian gauge in combination with the 1435 millimeter standard gauge.
With railways, a break of gauge occurs where a line of one gauge meets a line of a different gauge, specifically a different track gauge. Trains and rolling stock cannot run through without some form of conversion between the gauges, and freight and passengers must otherwise be transshipped or moved between vehicles. A break of gauge adds delays, costs and inconvenience. Transshipping freight from wagons of one gauge to wagons of another gauge is very labour and time intensive and inc also increases the risk of the goods being damaged. If the capacity of the freight cars on both systems does not match, additional inefficiencies can arise. Technical solutions to avoid transshipping include variable gauge axles, replacing the bogies of cars and using transporter cars that can carry a car or wagon of different gauge. So let's now look at some case studies. The journey from, excuse my pronunciation, Yi Wu to Madrid, 10,000 kilometers. The journey time is 21 days, but the alternative is six weeks by sea. Time is less critical. And from China through Poland and Western Europe, we have standard gauge of 1,435 millimeters in Russia and Belarus, we have the Russian gauge of 1,520 millimetres. And then in Spain, we have the Iberian gauge of 1,668 millimetres. So the solution was a bogey exchange method. So in terms of passenger trains, bogey exchange is inconvenient, although it's used in some of the slower trans-Siberian routes. The journey times are important on high speed intercity routes. On vehicle gauge change technology is now used predominantly on these routes. So in Spain, matters are somewhat complicated. They have four different gauges. There's been an increasing demand for international travel and with high speed rail, time is very important. Rebuilding or dual gauging the whole network would be far too expensive. So let's now have a look at some of the solutions to this problem. So at the Burgos Rosa de Lima station, they have a gauge change facility. And in this building, the rolling stock will pass through and will be automatically changed to the alternative gauge. In the YouTube playlist for this unit, you will find a short video showing how this facility operates. So let's now have a look at some of the rail vehicles and the track. So the Netherlands has the same track gauge as the UK. So look at this train carefully. Could this train photograph the Amsterdam Central Station carry passengers on the British Railway Network? Stop and have a think about it. This image shows a Freightliner Class 70, a British freight train in the UK on the West Coast Main Line, going to Moss End Freight Terminal in Glasgow. My question is, could this train continue north to Inverness? Pause and have a think about your answers to that question. So in addition to the track gauge, we must also consider the size of the vehicles using the railway and the size of the structures around the track. And these are known as the static and dynamic or kinematic loading gauges, respectively. So two key terms, loading gauge is a set of dimensions that load on a rail vehicle must be within to run in normal traffic. Structure gauge is a set of minimum dimensions relative to the track to which any structure must conform. The term clearance is the difference between the structure gauge and the loading gauge at any point. The Union Internationale de Chemin de Fer, the UIC, is an international organisation formed in 1922 comprising a union of various railway companies and administrations. 
it agrees common standards and practices. Let's now have a look at loading gauges. The UIC has defined international standards for loading gauge. Most of mainland Europe is constructed to UIC, GB or GC gauge. Legacy issues means that existing tracks may not conform. The UK has some of the smallest loading gauges in the world. Great Britain has, in general, the most restrictive loading gauge relative to track gauge in the world. This is a legacy of the British Railway Network being the world's oldest and having been built by a plethora of different private companies, each with different standards for the width and height of trains. After nationalisation, a standard static gauge, W5, was defined in 1951 that would virtually fit everywhere in the network. The W6 gauge is a refinement to the W5 and the W6A changed the lower body to accommodate third rail electrification. Network Rail uses a W loading gauge classification system of freight transport ranging from W6A, the smallest, through W7, W8, W9+, W10, W11 and W12, the largest. So virtually the entire UK network is cleared for W6. Gauges W7 through W12 for various size of shipping container, but only available on parts of the network. And the channel tunnel and high speed one line is constructed to UIC GC standard. In terms of passenger loading gauges, the UK has two passenger vehicle loading gauges. Passenger gauge PG1, 20 metres long, and passenger gauge 2, 23 metre long vehicles. The PG1 standard is shown here. So let's now have a look at structure gauges. So you can see an extract from Network Rail Standard TRK2049. This shows structure gauge for the upper sector and we can see reference to platform awnings, station foot bridges, to cater for 25 kilovolt electrification, columns and other fixed works and platforms, which also includes the faces of buildings. Here you can see the lower section of that guidance from Railway Group Standard GI slash RT7073, where dimension X varies depending on straight or curved track of different radii. Here you can see an image showing the meter gauge loading structure gauge for Myanmar. Significantly lower vehicles than UK and UIC loading gauges. A comparable width to UK vehicles. And here shipping container profiles are shown for comparison. So I'm now going to look at some of the answers to the questions I posed previously. So if you've ever been to the Netherlands, you'll remember that the trains have two decks. So railways in the Netherlands are designed to a different loading gauge, UIC GC. So in response to my question, the answer is no. This train is 3.02 metres wide and 4.65 metres high. It would not get very far before it hit a bridge or struck a platform edge in the UK, which would result in a catastrophic accident. OK, so back to the UK and looking at the freight train. So this would depend on the loading gauge of the train, but it appears unlikely judging by the container size. So remember that the UK network is cleared for W10 loading gauge only as far north as Glasgow. So the train would not be able to travel to Inverness. So now we're going to have a short look at a very costly mistake associated with structure gauging. So back in 2014, the Guardian newspaper reported that French railway operator SNCF had ordered hundreds of new trains that were too big. So what happened was that the national rail operator SNCF has ordered 
2,000 new trains that were too large for many of the stations that they were due to serve. So the train operator admitted failing to verify measurements it was given by the rail operator before ordering its new rolling stock. A very, very expensive mistake. So now we're going to have a look at the wheel rail interface. Rail vehicles run on wheel set. The wheel set comprises two wheels mounted on a solid axle. Wheel sets are usually mounted in pairs known as bogies. The wheels are fixed and unlike road vehicles, which have dif differential steering, which allows wheels to rotate at different speeds. Therefore, rail vehicles require a different method of steering. So, how do trains stay on the track? Now, it's all right building yourself a railway, but unless you're confident that the trains are going to stay on the tracks, it's not much use. And railway wheel design is a bit more cunning than you might think. If you imagine if you were to use just car-type wheels, flat, ready to go, put them on the track, and they do just what you'd expect. They stay on there for a little bit, but then they come off. So what about making wheels with a bit of a cone on them? rubbish. But if you turn the cones round and have them sat like this, it's spookily good. Have a look at this. It looks almost magic. Obviously it's not magic, it just kind of looks like it. Now we're going to look at chronicity and stability. To allow trains to steer around a curve, a conical wheel is used. The cone shape means that the wheel changes in effective radius as it moves transversely. Conicity, or gamma, is a measure of the angle between the wheel tread and the horizontal line of, a, of the axle. For a cylindrical wheel, conicity is zero. For a 1 in 20 tapered wheel, the conicity is 0 0.05. The greater the conicity, the smaller the radius of curve that theoretically can be traversed. The two images here show, on the left, the wheel set travelling along a straight track, where the wheel is centrally placed on the rail. The right-hand figure shows a right-hand curve. So, on the left-hand side wheel, the larger diameter of the cone is on the outside rail and on the right hand wheel the smaller diameter of the cone is on the inside rail. Whilst conicity is very helpful on curves, it can be detrimental on straight track. In theory, the wheel set should be perfectly centred on the track and should continue infinitely in a straight line. In practice, defects in the track and wheel set geometry and other rolling resistances mean that there is a lateral displacement from the rail centre. The wheels are often not perfectly round. For example, in some cases you might have a flat spot on the tyre. I'll explain what a tyre on a rail wheel set is at a later stage. Lateral displacement, the radius of one wheel is greater than another. Therefore, the wheel set naturally compensates and tries to reach an equilibrium by turning towards the track centre line. As the trajectory is sloped, the centre line is overshot and the process is reversed. The resulting path of the wheel set along the track is sinusoidal in nature, oscillating around an equilibrium. This is known as hunting oscillation. The term hunting originates from the fact that the system hunts for an equilibrium. Hunting oscillation affects ride quality and ultimately the overall stability of the vehicle. So for stability analysis, if lowercase r is the wheel radius, lowercase s is the track gauge, and gamma 
is the wheel conicity, it can be shown that the wavelength L of the oscillation is 2 pi the square root of Rs over 2 gamma. The frequency of the oscillation, lowercase f, at a given velocity, v, is the velocity divided by the wavelength. So let's now look at a worked example. A rail vehicle is running on standard gauge track and has wheels of 0.5 metre radius and conicity of 1 in 20. The running speed of the line is currently 80 km per hour. There is a proposal to increase the speed of trains running on this route to 120 km per hour. So, the first part of this question, what are the implications on passenger comfort of this speed change? The second part of the question, if the wheel sets in the vehicle are replaced with wheel sets of a 1 in 40 conicity, what would be the effect? So the wavelength can be calculated as follows, with L equal to 16.83 metres. So now we want to look at the frequency of the oscillation at the two different speeds. So first of all, at 80 km per hour, the frequency is 1.32 Hz. The frequency of the oscillation at 120 km per hour is 1.98 Hz. So the implication of this is that the frequency of the oscillation has increased, so passenger comfort may be decreased. So now if you look at what happens when we change the conicity of the wheel set to 1 in 40, the wavelength L changes to 23.80 metres, and the frequency of the oscillation now at 120 km per hour is 1.4 Hz. The frequency of oscillation has decreased a level similar to that before the change, i.e. 1.32 Hz. So passengers are very unlikely to notice any difference in comfort levels with the increased speed. Vehicle dynamics is a complex subject and is way beyond the scope of this module. Higher speed equals increased oscillation frequency. Earlier railways favoured conicity of about 1 in 20, but 1 in 40 is now becoming common, particularly on high speed lines. Track system geometry is very important. The stability of rail vehicles is heavily dependent on the civil engineering of the track. So now I'm going to provide an introduction to the track system. So in this image, I'm going to compare a ballasted track with slab track. So in terms of ballasted track, we see a subsoil layer, a formation layer, which forms a subgrade, then flexible support made up of subballast, ballast, then eventually the sleeper with the rail connected to the sleeper. Slab track is often used in positions where we want to maintain the position of the track and ensure its position. For example, in a tunnel, we may want to construct track of this nature. So in terms of subgrade, we'll have subsoil formation layer. And then in terms of inflexible support, we're going to have a ballast concrete layer, a concrete slab, typically reinforced, then possibly sleepers with rails connected to those sleepers. So let's look at the track loading system and the load path. So the wheel is in contact with the rail. The rail is then in contact with the base plate, which is in contact with the sleeper. And the sleeper then is in contact with the track bed and then the track bed in contact with the subgrade. Load transfer operates on the principle of stress reduction. The wheel rail contact patch is very small, around 1.3 centimetres squared. Consequently, stresses are very high and result in elastic and plastic deformation of the rail head. Wheel movement results in creep. Two components of rolling resistance include F1 from the vehicle movement, area S1, F2 from elastic deformation, area S2. S2 decreases with increasing speed.
Due to the small size of the contact patch, it is desirable to maximise contact with the rail. This minimises contact stresses and wear of the rail and reduces the effect of eccentric loading. To achieve this, the rail is inclined on its support. The angle of inclination should match the conicity of the wheel. Regardless of the country you're in, the track gauge or loading gauge, this is a typical railway cross-section. In the next few units, we're going to look at these elements in more detail. The foundation under the track has a camber to ensure the ease of water runoff to the drains provided on each side of the line. A layer of sand is normally laid over some sort of geotechnical membrane to separate the ballast from the foundation material below. Ballast is provided to give support, load transfer and drainage to the track and thereby keep water away from the rails and sleepers. The sleepers maintain the track gauge, distribute the load and fix the track into position. They can be wooden, concrete or even steel. The rail is designed to allow the vehicle to run as smoothly as possible. And in the next unit, we're going to look at this in much more detail. So in the next unit, unit two, we're going to look at the rail. In particular, we're going to look at the shape, metallurgy, and the rail as a beam and rail wear. So that's the end of part two of unit one. Thanks for listening and bye for now.